Um, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm Fran Stoddard, and uh, I am um, a co-founder of the Vermont Global Exchange. It was founded about um, almost 10 years ago by another woman and I, and we we realized that there are a lot of people in the state of Vermont who are doing international development work, and they didn't know each other. So we first started with uh, either people who ran businesses, uh, the CEOs, so they could network together and know who each who they each other were, and and help each other with different things like how do you deal with the State Department, how do you get grants for whatever. Um, what about secession? Because um, a lot of these people started in the 70s and 80s and just were doing remarkable work outside of our borders, but they returned to Vermont. And personally, I think, and this has been acknowledged by many of them, it's a place where they could go breathe deeply and re-energize and then hit the road again and uh, do the work that they were doing um, wherever. So that's how the Vermont Global Exchange began. Uh, it only meets a about once or twice a year. And uh, there was a point at which the CEOs then got to know each other after about five or six years. They, and then middle management was really interested in getting to know each other. So um, even though I said, it looks like we've done our thing, we're gonna, we're gonna fold up shop. They said, no, no, no. We Let's, let's keep this going. So we kept it going, and then I approached the University of Vermont because I thought it should be embedded somewhere. And academics were more interested. There were foundations that were interested. And so wonderfully, UVM said, yes, we are interested in being more international and doing more things international. We're interested in knowing more businesses and, uh, and NGOs that are working in the state of Vermont and work with them. Uh, so let's work out a partnership. And we created um, a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. And fortunately, now we have this beautiful space. Um, and it moves around on campus. And we sometimes might have it at, a, at, an, at another uh, venue as well. But we're really happy about that. We just realized today when I got lots of mad emails that this is not the best timing for academics, actually. <laughs> Though I'm pleased to see many of you here. Um, I did get, oh, I'm just swamped with finals and, and other things. So we're going to look at that. And if you have some suggestions, this is um, pr a pretty casual group. But the other thing that was really important about the Vermont Global Exchange is that not only did you hear some wonderful speakers, and you're going to it's really going to be wonderful this evening. But also, there's opportunity for us to be in dialogue and really discuss things and see if we can take the subject further by the people in the room. So that's part of what we're going to do uh, today. So um, what's happening tonight? The theme, uh, there's always a theme. And we can add new things. If somebody has an issue that's coming up, they want some feedback from other people who are interested in international development, they can bring some, that up at, at these meetings. So um, know that that can happen. But the thing that was really top of mind at the last meeting was dealing with misinformation or disinformation. It's very interesting how they're different. One is just wrong, and one is purposefully wrong. Uh, they're both happening all around us uh, these days. So, um, and it's a it's a real problem, and it's very tricky. In um, as we as we, it's tricky enough in the United States. It's also very tricky when you're moving into a different culture. Um, so uh, that will be interesting, and also the power of story. They're really separate, and they mix. Um, and we're going to hear about that tonight. So we have three uh, amazing speakers. They are going to talk for, you know, um, I said five to seven. It might leak into ten, but I'm going to try to keep them fairly short so we can also start the dialogue a little bit um, quicker than you might on, on some panels. Um, then I'd like to, well, maybe split in, in two groups just to really dig in deep into one or two subjects that, that came up for 20 minutes or something, come back, report out, uh, we'll do just a little bit more business, and then we'll eat and network some more. So that's the plan for the evening. 
We are very honored to have uh, CCTV here this evening. Uh, that's Charlie. So um, if any of you have issues about this will be broadcast, come on in. Um, uh, on CCTV uh, eventually. So if that's an issue for anybody, let, let us know or sit in the back. Um, we will also um, make sure that we know who's, who's in the room in a minute. Know that uh, there is an online option, so if anybody's online on Teams, welcome. We welcome you. Not sure that anybody is, is here yet. They, everybody wants it, and then, hello, where are they? Anyway, um, and I particularly want to thank Tricia Coates for uh, hosting us tonight. She is the head of the Office of Engagement and our latest supporter. So I, I would like her to say a few words. There she is. Tricia, thank you so much. Thank you, Fran, and thank you all for coming. Welcome to UVM. Um, we're really happy to have you, and I am Tricia Coates. I'm the director of UVM's Office of Engagement and the Leahy Institute for Rural Partnerships. And really, our job as the Office of Engagement is to provide an open door uh, for the community of Vermont. And so we're, we're just thrilled to have you here, and we're also um, really inspired by the partnership that our office has had with the Vermont Global Exchange for a few years now. Um, because not only are we able to have host these wonderful events and engage in um, really substantive conversations, but we're also able to um, meet some really wonderful leaders who have made a difference not only in their communities, but in the world. It's an incredible opportunity for our students and faculty to be inspired and to find connections. Um, so this is our job and we're really happy to be here with you, Fran, and with your group. So let's have a good night. Come on to that. Come on to that. <laughs> I shut off my phone. I hope it's not someone trying to they need to text they need to text me. <laughs> Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, Sadie. Um, is it Gaffin? Yeah. Okay, I got I should. I should know that. She's been the, a remarkable intern uh, from the, the university here. That you want to? Yes. Yeah, step out. <laughs> <laughs> that has updated the website. If you haven't been to the Vermont Global Exchange website, it's worth going to. There are notes from other meetings. You'll see the people that are members so far. Um, and we encourage, uh, we, we want to expand this. I, I think, I hope I made that, that clear. Who else is in, interested in international development it, from the state of Vermont? What's going on? Um, so we're expanding that, and Sadie has been amazing at updating that and also making sure that this event uh, comes off smoothly, which it, it certainly is. Thank, Thank you. you. And Cecilia is taking notes. Thank you to Cecilia. And uh, Daria, I think, is also, Daria, right there, right in front of me. <laughs> That's who you got your email from. Um, and is Emma? Emma's not here. OK, so many thanks to all of them. Come on in. Well, you're just in time to find out who's in, who's in the room. And we are, hi, hi. Great to see you. Take a seat. So this is uh, just very briefly, before we get to our speakers, we just want to have a sense of who's in the room. So um, just your name, your organization, or affiliation, um, uh, maybe just your principal focus. Um, uh, of your organization or you know your your work in international development um, uh, pronouns are optional but certainly welcome and I'm gonna start with the people who just came in the door because I have this microphone and then I'll help get the microphone around to other people yeah oh excellent okay thanks welcome hello Am I the last person to, to speak here, or? No, you're the first. Uh, oh, okay. I don't think Hi, yeah, this, this is, is not. This is, I'm sorry, this is only for the CCTV 
Okay. Um, right now, so this is actually optional for CCTV. This, this might be cut out or if anybody has an issue that, that could be, but this is certainly part of today's, we, we want to know who's in the room. Okay. Before we start with questions. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Freund, and I work for a company called Wildlife Works. Um, we are a wildlife and forest conservation company, and we work um, primarily in three regions in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and um, mostly Central Africa. Um, and we are engaged with local communities in these, these regions, um, and we essentially uh, partner with, with communities in these areas to um, generate income for them in exchange for protecting their environment and the biodiversity that lives within it. Yeah, I'm Simon Bird, and also for Wildlife Works. Hi, I'm Megan Epler Wood. Um, I have a private consulting company, which is named after me, and then I am uh, <laughs> presently uh, managing director of the Sustainable Tourism Asset Management Program, which is a research program at Cornell University in the SC Johnson College of Business, as part of the Sustainable Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise. Uh, STAMP was founded in 2017 under my direction in partnership with my company and uh, we are presently uh, doing education and research worldwide. And I must say, Megan um, probably founded Sustainable Tourism. Well, so Ecotourism, ecotourism as one of the core group, yeah. Uh, an amazing person so who lives right here in Burlington. Thanks. And, and does that work from there. So right behind you. Hi, I'm Donna O'Malley. I'm uh, she, her. I'm a librarian at the University of Vermont, and uh, I was drawn to this presentation for the dealing with disinformation perspective that you folks have. And I'm always up for the power of story, too, so I'm really looking forward to the discussion. I'm Eric Garza. I uh, am a faculty member here at the University of Vermont. I teach part-time in College of Ag and Life Sciences and Community Development and Applied Economics is my program. I also, and the reason I'm here, I don't do any international development work, but I founded a, a business that I do education through outside of and independent from the university called Quillwood Academy. And one of the things that I'm very interested in is exactly this issue of, of disinformation, misinformation, and um, storytelling. And I'll be leading a reading group around a book that came out in March of this year called Science Versus Story, which tackles exactly this, written by a woman named Emma Francis Bloomfield. Awesome. Thank you. Quillwood, Q-U-I-L-L is -L in porcupine quills, and then wood, W-O-O-D. So hello, everyone. My name is Lakeland Taylor. My preferred pronouns are she, hers. I am a postdoctoral researcher here at the University of Vermont. I primarily do research in risk and crisis communication, specifically related to natural disasters, and that's the project that I'm working on here at UVM is looking at flood warning communication, not only in Vermont, but throughout the United States. I am interested in this topic specifically. I don't do a lot with uh, international development, but a lot of the work that I do in risk and crisis communication has to do with storytelling and misinformation and disinformation. That's Those are three pretty heavy topics right now in the scholarship that I work in. So uh, thank you all, and it's great to be here. Our microphone should, we, should we go back? Sure, go back. <coughs> we'll go back, and then we'll go forward. <laughs> Does that work? Perfect. I'll help. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Bernier. I am the Director of Events and Operations at the Vermont Council on World Affairs. Um, so we work mostly in citizen diplomacy, and we do that through international exchange programs for youth and adults, um, and also public events and educational programs. Uh, again, Tricia Coates, Director of UVM's Office of Engagement and the Leahy Institute for Rural Partnerships, and um, grateful host of the Vermont Global Exchange this evening. Thanks for coming. Hi, I'm Cecilia Boyson. I'm a senior at UVM, and I'm studying community and international development, and I'm also an intern with the Office of Engagement and the Leahy Institute for Rural Partnerships this semester. 
Hi, I'm Autumn. Um, I'm Sadie's roommate, which is really why I'm here um, to support her. But I recently graduated from UVM studying political science and linguistics, and so this um, topic was really interesting. That's why I'm here. Thank you. You're not alone. <laughs> my name is Barbara Leslie. I'm here because Fran is my friend. <laughs> Um, I'm not currently working in international development, but I have a long history of working in different aspects of international community and international development, primarily in communication uh, development in El Salvador at the post-Civil War a phase of, of dealing with overcoming disinformation and bringing a child's view to the power of story in order to affect community change on a national level. I work with the United Nations Development uh, Projects to do that and also in their agricultural development aspects. Um, then what I do, and then, uh, uh -huh. yeah, Haiti Circle of Friends working with Haiti. And um, so that's uh, a few other things, but that about sums it up for this. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Tom Griffin, and like Autumn, I'm here as part of the Sadie Fan Club, um, <laughs> as I am full-time, uh, I'm faculty um, at, the Lar at UVM's Larner College of Medicine, where I teach environmental public health. Um, in my other world, I serve in the Army Reserve and coordinate um, humanitarian response efforts between the Department of Defense, Department of State, USAID, NGOs, private companies, et cetera. So I'm kind of here for a couple of reasons, and it's cool to get to learn from you all and uh, meet some familiar faces and some new faces. Thank you. Terrific. We had a speaker from the National Guard last time. Yeah, it was great. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Crody. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm in the Office of Engagement and Lincoln Institute for Rural Partnerships. So we're really excited to have you all here at UVM, and I'm just excited for the conversation and to learn more about each of your organizations and what brings you here to the conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Daria Gerani. I also use she, her pronouns. I am the program manager for the Leahy Institute for Rural Partnerships. I also work in the Office of Engagement very closely with all my colleagues. Um, so happy to host you all here. Um, I am really excited for this event, not only to support Vermont Global Exchange, um, but before I came to UVM, I was a grant writer for the American Red Cross. So I had to do a lot with story and with making sure the story we're telling is what's actually happening and that's a lot harder to synthesize than it sounds. Um, so I'm very fascinated by this topic and just happy to be here. Hi, um, I'm Greta Gerani. I'm Daria's wife and um, I am a preschool teacher and an artist and we are both kind of semi-new to Vermont. We got here in September, so I'm both excited to hear about the, the global exchange and also still learning a, a little bit about Vermont. So I'm excited for, for, for this. Thank you. All right. Um, why am I here tonight? I'm here because four years ago, I fell down what I call the rural rabbit hole. I've been in Vermont for 10 years. And four years ago, I got really interested in rural entrepreneurship and, you know, and economic development in smaller towns and spaces. It's led me to a partnership with Trisha and the Leahy Institute, and it's led me to organizing a conference on rural entrepreneurship and small business here at Vermont from the 19th to the 21st of June. So in the spirit of transparency, I'm shamelessly plugging my conference. <laughs> uh, we're talking about this is information, not disinformation. Um, now. Who am I? Um, I am also someone who's lived and worked abroad. I've lived and worked in Germany from 93 to 99, as well as from 2005 to 2010. Lived and worked in Scotland from 2010 to 2014, so I've been quite a, almost a third of my life overseas. Um, currently, as I said, I'm interested in entrepreneurship in smaller spaces. I'm actually a professor of entrepreneurship at the Grossman School of Business. And oh, by the way, my name is Eric Munson. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kristen Andrews. I'm the internship coordinator with the Office of Engagement and the Career Center, and I also work with the Leahy Institute. Hi, my name is Gail Stevenson, and uh, let me see, I ran the Vermont Council on World Affairs for quite a few years, 
And then most recently, I've been working, doing climate work, specifically with black carbon, uh, and, which is soot. And then uh, also, I would, uh, um, a while ago, I worked in Ukraine, not in Ukraine, in Poland with Ukrainian refugees at a refugee resettlement center. Hi, I'm Colin Anderson. I'm a Canadian living here. Um, and I work at the UVM Institute for Agroecology, where I'm the associate director, I'm also a research professor in plant and soil sciences, but I'm not a plant and soil scientist. Um, <laughs> most of my work looks at um, how to transform institutions and communities and policies to support transitions in food systems towards more socially just and sustainable food systems. And so our program is involved in a lot of international work as well as work here in Vermont. And so we actually think very carefully about how to cross-pollinate between our work in the Andes, in Mesoamerica, in Africa, in Europe, and how we can bring ideas and people here. So we have um, a Brazilian French student who's coming in five days here for three months, and we have her advisor who's French and is going to come for the month of July to facilitate exchanges. So those are the kinds of things that we do. We also have courses that we teach online that have people from all over the world that participate in them. That Kristen was in one of the courses last semester. Um, yeah, and so those are some of the things that we do. Very happy to be here to meet you all. Cool. Okay, I'm going to introduce you guys. And you were so good at this that you are in charge. Yeah. Let's do this. We'll keep this one on this side of the room. And we'll oh, look at that. Okay. There we go. Okay. We're getting more. <laughs> Thank you. It's really great to know who's in the room. Just, um, you know, because it's, it's not overwhelming to, to do that. So thank you for um, listening and getting a sense of who we are here. Yeah, if you, if you want to move around or, or move up or get some food, I hope that you do because there's plenty and we will have time at the end to get more. So let's, let's keep this casual enough that you feel comfortable doing that. Also, restrooms around the corner at the top of the stairs where you came in. Um, if uh, you need a bio break, just um, please help yourself. Okay, um, I would like to introduce our speakers. If you guys would feel better like doing what I'm doing, leaning against a podium and standing, that would be fine, or however you want to do it, or sitting. I'm, I'm going to move, remove myself once I have introduced Steve Shepard. So Steve Shepard was uh, one of the original um, members here of the Vermont Global Exchange. He was founder of Shepard Communications Group in Williston and many other, a couple other organizations. He is an author, a photographer, um, an audio producer, an educator. He's doing a b blog now that's really taking taking off and he's having a blast with it. He's written over a hundred books and articles on a wide variety of topics. He has worked in more than a hundred countries. I know it's a hundred, a hundred, but it happens to be true. <laughs> and I think that's about half the countries in the world, something like that. Anyway, um, he serves clients consulting as a consulting analyst. Um, he has for years across many different industries, including telecommunications, IT, media, advertising, healthcare, transportation, government, software development, education, professional services, NGOs, venture capital, and, um, and regulatory. I first met him at Champlain College when he was doing much of that work. And thanks to a childhood in Spain, he also is fluent in Spanish, and that's what kicked him off um, into a career that took him all around the world. Uh, Steve is, uh, because he's, he's worked in technology on all of these things and has dealt with this information, we're starting with a kind of that aspect of this whole piece. And he'll have things to say about leadership and many more things. And we will start with Steve Shepard. Do you want to do you want to sit where you are, or do you want to podium lean? Oh, I don't care. I'll stand. How about that? Okay. There you go. All righty. Hi, everyone. Glad to glad to have you here. Thanks for uh, filling up the room for us. Um, I'm not sure who that was that Fran described, but I was available and I came. So. <laughs> this concept of disinformation versus misinformation, et cetera is obviously a critical one, especially today. And I spent a lot of my time, I, I've spent about 45 years of my career within the sort of telecom world. And 
I will freely say that the technology itself, frankly, bores me to tears. I really don't care. I have to know it because of what I do. But what I'm really interested in is what happens when we take a new technology. For example, if we take mobility, right, mobile telephony, and bring it to a country that's never had it before, what happens in terms of increasingly transparent government, better education, better health care? What happens in terms of the creation of hope and opportunity and so on? That's, that's really what I care about. And so I've had the honor of being on the ground in a lot of these places that Fran mentioned that, um, that have caused my children and my wife to play the Where's Waldo game in terms of like, where is Ouagadougou again? Is that, what continent is that on? You know, I mean, that's where he is. I'm not sure where he is. But I want to talk to you about four elements that I believe contribute to the growth and spread of disinformation. And they're very much seemingly unrelated. The first one is leadership, or frankly, a dearth of it. Leadership to me is a pretty boneheaded concept, at least in terms of the way I think about it. And I've spent the bulk of my career advising leaders on how to deal with a lot of the technology changes and so on. Leadership is a fine art. It's the art of creating a vision of a more desirable future than the one you have today, and then enrolling people to help you achieve it. It's about creating a new status quo, a status quo that's better than the one we have today, and then enrolling people to help you achieve it. The problem we have today is that far too many leaders are leaders because they outlived everyone else and they inherited the corner office. It doesn't mean that they have the skills to do it. Back in the 80s when I was working for the telephone company in California, I used to go around and steal cubicle humor. Remember, People used to put like their favorite joke up on the wall and make copies of it. And I still have this binder about this thick of this incredible timeless humor. And this particular one related to leadership said, where are they? Which way did they go? I have to find them. I'm their leader. I think that captures it pretty nicely. So hold that thought for just a moment, OK? You want me to close that door? Oh, I'm sorry. Please, 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 please. come on in. We'll, we'll try to keep the, the crowds at bay. Maybe, sure. OK. The second factor I want to talk about is the concept of what's called a scotoma. A scotoma is a concept or a malady, if you will, that's very well known to the world of ophthalmology. Okay, the medicine of the eye. And it means a blind spot. Blind spots usually happen because of an injury or macular degeneration or the separation of a retina, whatever it may be. But in the world of, of business, in the world of commerce, in the world of what we're talking about here today, global development, it's really about the fact that we don't know what we don't know. And we often have blind spots that cause us to, frankly, worship the status quo. So status quo. Okay, my, my undergraduate work was in a field that no one's ever heard of called romance philology, which is a study of the origins of romance languages. Okay, status quo, the way things are. Well, the problem with the status quo is that it causes us to accept that good enough is good enough. It causes us to have that wonderful phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It causes people like Tom Peters to say, if it ain't broke, break it, because it probably is broken and you just haven't noticed it. You've been looking at it too long. The problem with worshiping that status quo is that it causes us to become complacent. And when we become complacent, we stop moving forward. And that is as true of information analysis and acceptance as it is of growing or changing a business. The third factor that I think we have to think about is the idea that everyone's looking for the easy button today. Honestly, we have become a culture that is obsessed with convenience, right? Everyone's willing to put the bumper sticker on the car that says use less plastic as they're shopping for plastic wrapped apples in the grocery store, right? Everybody talks about how nice it is to drag their wagon down to the grocery store to do their shopping, except it's too hot, it's too cold, I look silly dragging a wagon, I, all kinds of reasons. Companies spend their time measuring things like return on assets, return on equity, return on capital, return on sales. I think we're measuring the wrong thing. I think what we should be measuring is return on inconvenience. That really is the measure that we should be looking at because if it takes no effort, the result will be equivalent. Okay? The fourth thing that I want to talk about is one that's going to sound a little strange, but I'm going to plant this seed because I think it's worth thinking about. And that is that I believe that we are suffering from a severe loss of reverence. 
And I don't say that in any kind of a religious or spiritual way. I say it in terms of the, the classic definition of reverence, which is equal parts awe and wonder and curiosity. The minute we lose reverence, we lose respect for institutions that have gotten us where we are. The example I like to use is the, this changing of the guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier. If you've, ever had a ch if you've ever been there, you know that if anyone giggles or laughs or says a word during that ceremony, they very quickly have a very threatening military person standing right here, ready to escort them off the property because this is a moment of reverence. It has nothing to do with the person that is in that tomb. It has everything to do with what that tomb represents. When people attacked the Capitol, they weren't attacking the outcome of the presidency election. They were attacking what the election stands for. And that is the single most dangerous thing that we face today. It's not about the person in the office, it's about the office. And when we lose reverence, we lose that need to worship those things. And again, not in any kind of a spiritual sense, but out of a sense of respect and awe and wonder, that's what we lose. And so when I think about this problem of disinformation, that is what I see it directed at. I want to see people being leaders. I want to see people saying, yeah, but what if, and then asking the question. I want to see people saying, you know, normally I would just accept that because I've got an easy button, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to check just one more source. I understand. I mean, Hillary Clinton probably is running a child porn ring out of a pizza shop in Philly, but just going to check one more source just to make sure. It doesn't take all that much if we expose those blind spots and choose to address them in a way that helps us deal with these issues. Okay? All right, I'll shut up now. Thank you for that food for thought. So digest that a little bit. A lot, a lot in there of questioning, reverence, complacency, convenience. Leadership, <clears throat> important. Okay, we're gonna move into uh, the story realm with a, a, um, a professional storyteller and um, marketer, Missy Thurston. Grew up in Vermont with a very creative family. I knew her dad way back in the, in the day. She is currently the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Population Media Center, a remarkable NGO that was also one of the original um, members of the Vermont Global Exchange. Um, it creates entertainment media for global good and behavior change uh, with TV, radio, and um, even online programs broadcast in more than 50 countries, uh, created and produced by in, in country, so all the actors and producers and, and writers are from in country. Uh, there was actually also, um, however, a game that was made with Champlain College that dealt with uh, bullying and uh, domestic violence um, issues that uh, became very successful in several countries and is continuing to, to change and be used in, in that way. So across many mediums, uh, telling story because people listen differently and they get it in in a way that's very different from just hearing a lecture, <laughs> for, for example. Uh, Missy has more than 15 years of, of this experience in marketing and communications and more than a decade um, of experience leading highly effective also public health brands and campaigns. And I know that here at the university there's a lot of people in, interested in public health. So Missy, without further ado, I will let you talk about the power of story. I'm going to stand over here just not to have my back to anyone. Um, so, but then you're kind of behind the podium. Um, but thank you for having me. Um, at the last Vermont Global Exchange, one of the questions that we went through the, the audience and asked was, what's the major challenge facing us today globally? And my immediate response, of course, given the work that we do at PMC, was going to be violence against women because one in three women around the world will experience violence in their lifetime, and one in three is not an acceptable number of women. No, what number of women? Can you? Speak a yeah, yeah. The microphone isn't giving you sound; it's just your own voice. 
Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can yeah. drop the microphone okay. for the, the camera. Oh, 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 okay. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Yes. No, thank you. Um, but the, one of the people that went for me was talking, their answer was misinformation and disinformation. And as I thought about that, that I, I changed my answer when it came to my answer to the question because I do think we are living in a world where misinformation and disinformation is accelerating at a rate where we have to give it due attention. And it's going to only continue as we see AI take over much of the content that we're experiencing because so much content that we take in, of course, is digital. And if AI can't tell what is a true court case and what is not a true court case, which is a pretty clear yes or no answer, then they certainly can't identify many other truths and, and nuances and information. So. As Fran approached uh, me for this for tonight, and just thinking about you know this conversation, what are we going to talk about? And what's the pieces that, from my experience, that I would want to highlight? I think for me, the one of the key elements to understanding and thinking about misinformation or disinformation for me is thinking about just how we interpret information, how we take that in and make it part of our shared experience and, ex and story. And the reason that's important is because it's way, way easier to learn something new that we've never ever had any impression or information on than if we're telling, if we're being, if we're learning that something that we previously thought is no longer correct, right? So there's so much interesting information on this out there. A lot of it focused on children, actually, you know, so there's studies ranging from like if a child learns something new, they have to learn it 10 times, then they've got it. But if they're adjusting information they have, they have to learn it 400 times, and then they've got it. There's also a lot of information related to crisis communication. So we saw so much learning come out of the COVID experience, right? Here we have information where we've got disinformation, people who are uh, changing science. And then we also have just information is changing. There's no malintent behind any of this. There's, there's just we don't know and we're learning so that means people have to adjust what they understand you know here's what we thought was true at this time but now it's this at pmc we're usually working in the misinformation or disinformation space because we're working on issues related to contraception and birth control we're working on issues related to women's status should they be allowed to participate in family decisions what should their role be can they actually hold higher office and there are very strong already pre-existing beliefs on this these questions so what we're doing is we're going in and we're working to shift something that's already in place, which is very, very different. So a good example is that like, if, if you have a headache and you know you have a headache, I can just put up a billboard that gives the location for the nearest pharmacy, right? I don't have to convince you that you have a headache and I don't have to convince you that ibuprofen is going to be something that could help your headache. This is shared information, we're on the same page. But I can't put up a billboard if we're not on that shared information same page. I can't put up something that's very simple if it's something that you already have incorporated into your own story. Whenever we hear a different piece of information, we test it against what we already know, and then we fit it in there. It could be as simple as ibuprofen will help my headache. I then use ibuprofen, and I have so many different lived experiences that I'm relying on to say, I know it helps. So when Eric tells me it's not going to, I'm like, it will for me, Eric. <laughs> I've done it before, right? It, it, and it's also reinforced by I see ads for pharmacies. And I, I have all of these different things around me. So when somebody tells me a new piece of information, I'm going to test it against all these different stories that I'm hearing from all these different places. With us, the way we use story is we use story to role model and have different lived experiences. So we have fictional characters that are um, going through their own life experiences and they're gonna role model different things that happen to them throughout the course of the, the stories. And part of what that does is it allows us to get at nuance, which is one of the biggest challenges we have with misinformation, disinformation, because there's the, the human brain and the way we think, we want something to be right or wrong. 
So if we hear something that is not comfortable for us, our first response is going to be that is wrong. Full stop, it's completely wrong. But if you have story, you're able to wrap it into something that presents multiple, multiple pieces of it. So contraception is something that we work on with our stories a lot. And one of some of the fears that we're addressing in the communities where we're working is, I'm afraid that I'll be infertile if I were to t take um, any kind of contraception. I'm, fear, I'm afraid of extreme side effects if I take contraception. We also work against as soon as my wife and or my daughter is on contraception, she will be super promiscuous and she will sleep with anything that walks, right? So the stories that we tell allow the, the characters to exhibit different behaviors and you see the pros and the cons because contraception is also not all sunshine and roses, right? Everybody's body is different and there are gonna be side effects and things that you've got to work through and navigate. But is it the story that that particular community currently understands around contraception? Or what it allows or enables for your wife to be a partner in income? You know, we've had so many stories and, and um, letters from audience members where it's like, we never realized that we could, this could be a partnership in terms of providing for our family. So demonstrating just different options and and how it works and how it fits into those pre-existing stories really allows us to make sure that we're not just negating and saying this is right and this is wrong because that's not always the case you know instead we can say here are the different aspects around these different issues and let people ask themselves questions does would that work for me does that fit into the story as i understand it and it makes the information so much more memorable because just like with the student example adults are obviously the same except probably our numbers the discrepancy between learning originally and having to relearn is probably much greater than a child <laughs> Stories also help us remember, right? They help us lock it in, be able to go back to it. They also help us share it, um, be able to tell other people, you know, this is the story. This is what happened to this particular person who made this choice or did this thing, um, or this is how it impacted me. So I guess in short, I would just say that misinformation and disinformation is not going anywhere. In fact, it's actually dramatically increasing. And because of the amount of information that's now available to people, more so than ever before, it's going to be harder and harder to convince people that facts are true because you will find opposing facts constantly. Um, but through the use of story, and story that's based in really understanding where the people are that you're talking to, where are they coming from, where, what is their experience, helps you raise conversations and address misinformation or disinformation in a way that allows hopefully you and the, the person you're talking to to grow, to continue to understand more and think about more of the variables and the, um, the ways in which whatever it is that you're talking about fits into the, the world that we all share. So I will stop there. We, we have a third speaker who is um, um, a journalist and a political analyst and knows a lot about what's going on in Africa. But before we get to Eric, um, I, I don't want to lose if, if people are like, ah, burning question. There will be a, a Q&A after um, Eric also speaks. But if, you know, but, uh, there's this thing that, that Steve said that I really want to uh, get to and, and or Missy. We can get to that or we can have the conversation after we hear from everybody. Everybody good? Moving on? Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for closing the door, Colin. I think it was it was time. We, we welcome the people who came in. We'll make sure that we have you introduced um, after Eric speaks. So thank you for, for getting here. Um, so let me, let me tell you a little bit about um, Eric. Agnero. Yeah, Agnero. 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 Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, he is from the Ivory Coast. He's specializing in U.S. African affairs. He's reported for CNN, and he served on the international broadcaster at Voice of America in Washington, D.C. 
Uh, his experience as a communication expert at the African Union has enriched his understanding of media dynamics, highlighting the overlooked needs of ordinary people in media coverage. So he really watches out for what are people saying and are, are they, what are they missing. Since moving to Vermont in 2012 um, and then returning again recently, he went back to Africa for a while. He came, he came back to try Vermont again and we are very glad that he did. Um, he actively engages in community media uh, projects, including CCTV. We're glad that they're here today. He serves as the executive director at the Vermont Institute of Community and International Engagement, and he's involved in AALV, another um, member, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, Toward Freedom, and the Media Factory. Uh, he is committed to authentic storytelling, empowering local African journalists to tell their own narratives and promote the content independent successes, challenging all those stereotypes that we know often perpetuated by the mainstream media. Eric. Oh, thank you so much. Oh. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm from Ivory Coast, so every time you buy it on a chocolate bar, a tree has been cut down. In Ivory Coast, I've uh, done a documentary with CNN on this issue, with the children working, and then we had uh, much support from uh, Senator Leahy. And that's why I came to Vermont, because, you know, as an African, when I was um, uh, hired by the uh, Voice of America to, uh, to uh, work on my, uh, my uh, African friends so that they can accept anything from the mainstream, you know, business, you know, political. So I went to Voice of America, and then one day I realized that I was being used, in fact, to uh, brainwash people and to, uh, because be careful. You know, sometimes uh, misinformation is it's it's like beauty in the eyes of the beholder, right? So uh, for the U.S. government right now, it's only China and Russia that are doing misinformation because they're now growing very, very much in the West Africa region and uh, menacing, you know, the U.S. interest. The U.S. that is the best ally of France and France that is keeping more than 14 countries over the under col past colonial rule. But status quo, Steve said, is something that you know, is dangerous because the U.S. said, it's not my turf, it's the turf of the French. We are good friends with the French. So we're going to be uh, friends, I mean, we're going to be okay, we're, gonna, we're not condoning, but we're not saying anything. Also, because I'm a storyteller, I like less to do the talk. I like to see a movie or a documentary or a piece of you know, video that gives an idea and then we can go back to uh, discuss. And it's, it's about you know, what is going on in Africa right now vis-a-vis -vis Russia's influence. The US and Russia are at odds. So now everything <laughs> over there is about uh, uh, um, uh, what you call uh, 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 it's about the U.S. being, um, it's about Russia being uh, the father of misinformation. Like if we don't know that, you know, uh, uh, we've had a lot of misinformation coming from the Western governments. Like, so here's a little story that was put out there by uh, Deutsche Welle. Deutsche Welle is like the equivalent of Voice of America for the German. And, and Radio France International for the French, and BBC. Very big uh, misinformation house powers, so. <laughs> this is Kim a French Beninese influencer spreading pro-Russian and anti-Western propaganda on social media. Right after Russia began its full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, he posted this video. Really? Fact is, Russia invaded a sovereign, independent nation and took parts of Ukraine's territory. It's only one of the false claims the influencer has shared online in support of Russia in this war. His message reaches many people. More than one million people follow him on Facebook and over 250,000 on Instagram. He is part of a growing network of people who claim to be Pan-African. Investigative research done by several international media companies and open source collectives shows Seba has close ties to the Russian private military company Wagner Group. 
along with other influencers like Natalie Yong, who calls herself the Lady of Sochi. Yong has been a speaker at events sponsored by the Russian government. The US government and the open source project All Eyes on Barca concluded that Moscow is paying a number of local influencers to spread propaganda across the African continent. Hi, all right, um, um, so you're trying to find out what are some of the hot button issues, what are some of the, the more polarizing issues, and then inflaming those, kind of um, getting people worked up around them. Opinions among Africans are divided when it comes to the war in Ukraine. Not everyone is persuaded by the pro-Russian views. In most countries shown in a recent poll, a majority believe the Russian invasion of Ukraine was against international law and that Russia is guilty of committing war crimes in Ukraine. Still, Russia continues to try and undermine democracy in several African countries, particularly affected Mali, Sudan, the Central African Republic and Zimbabwe. In three of these countries, the Russian paramilitary Wagner Group operates and videos like this appear. Another example of Russian propaganda, this time targeting Mali, Burkina Faso and Ivory Coast. The Ganda video was viewed thousands of times on social media and appears to be directly linked to the Wagner Group. Anti-French sentiment also appears to be on the rise in former French colonies like Mali and their governments are looking for ways to distance themselves from the former colonial power. This has made way for Russia to present itself as a peacekeeper that defends Africa. For South African researcher Justin Arenstein, Russia's goal is to appear as an alternative to the status quo. Even prior to the Ukrainian war, we saw Russia um, aggressively trying to build support for its policies, often when they were contrary to European or NATO or North American policies. Arenstein adds that Russia is not the only country investing in propaganda in African countries. Many want to gain more influence in the region, however, Russia does it in a particular way. They undermine open societies, they undermine the ability of, of citizens to make their own choices, and that there is a level of physical um, coercion involved. While Russia remains isolated in global politics, experts say it needs Africa. By spreading fake news propaganda and anti-Western narratives, they want to gain influence on the African continent and show they have a role to play. Jan, let's get more. All right. Joins here in the studio. So quickly, so you you get a, a sense of what's going on over there. I I couldn't find a video in Russia, and you couldn't li uh, hear it any anyway. Understand? So. Uh, probably if you listen to the Russians, they will say that, you know, Never if you mind. listen to the Russians, they will say that, you know, Americans are doing that, the French. And in fact, that video is about uh, 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 France in the West, in the Sahel region, in the West African region, you know, uh, 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 I mean, holding all these people, you know, they, that is not said. Of course, this could be factual. Because indeed, the Russians are very, very active in, in the region. But what it, it doesn't say that it's a reaction to a problem that has been there, not today, not with the uh, Ukraine war, since the divide of the world into the Western world and Eastern whatever. So why are the Russians so active there. When you listen to the journalists, it looks like the Africans don't have a brain. They just glibly accept who comes there. No. Russia has a history of fighting colonialism in Africa. Russia, Cuba, all of them were in South, I mean, helping South Africa when this oppressive, brutal, and inhuman regime of apartheid was holding millions of local people. It was their land before the Boers and the, the, the English came there. Russia has been everywhere in Africa to fight the, the Western you know, world when it was about getting the resources, everything. So when Russian 
uh, how do you call it, stroll, uh, I mean, Russian, uh, I mean, uh, manipulators, go to Africa. They have an audience. Because the US government, France, are holding their future in the name of, OK, we colonize you. You know, you don't know better. We can. So that's why Russia is gaining momentum over there. So if you don't see that part of the story, you will, I'm not condoning what Russia over there. I grew up with a picture of Kennedy, Robert, I mean, uh, uh, JFK in my house. My father didn't wear any other shoes but Florsheim <laughs> shoes. My mother was dancing all the tunes from America. We are, I'm, I'm not saying pro-America, but in Africa, there are people who still, a joke, when I was younger, if you didn't have your Levi's 501, you wouldn't walk with us, <laughs> you know? At that time, we had Made in America t-shirts. If your t-shirt was made <laughs> somewhere else, you wouldn't walk out with us. Just to tell you that there is a pro-natural friendship towards America over there because nobody can do it like, like this more than Elvis Presley, OK? Me, if you send me to China, no way. I'm not against no China, but I don't know. I don't like vodka. I like whiskey. But if the guy who sells the vodka comes to my, I mean, the whiskey comes to my country and team against local tyrants, team against, I mean, with, 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 uh, with anything that is not good for Africa, maybe an year for Russia. So in that uh, propaganda, misinformation war, we have to be careful to know what is behind it. And usually, the higher the stakes, and especially now that Europe is in decline economically, so Europe wants to go back to, to, to Africa. Really, France doesn't want to let go. And then you have people like me in, 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 in Africa who didn't grow up as, a, as a, a subject of the empire of France, but of, I want to be considered as a, a, a citizen of the world, not an African to whom state departments send only condoms during the AIDS you know, uh, uh, pandemic, thinking that Africa is just has a problem of promiscuity. You know, I was there, I worked for, uh, for many programs on health in Africa. It was all about helping these guys that cannot refrain from. So the first, uh, I mean, uh, strategy when it was about AIDS fell because you were talking to people that you consider too libre, eh? okay? and not a, someone with whom you can discuss about what kind of treatment. How can we do that? So to end, I'm so happy tonight because I battled all my life ADHD. I was told you cannot do anything, but here I am. I went through a very interesting uh, career going from environmental affairs you know, to, to journalism and going around, and now, I have tonight here everything that I want for the future. I have people with whom I want to uh, contribute all that I've gained over this year in environmental affairs. I can talk about cacao to those who want to do agroforestry. I was into agroforestry and I also dream about now that I tamed down ADHD to have a contribution to academia. Because I think that academia is where we can do much. When I came to the US to work for the Voice of America in 2000, uh, no, in, in 1996, uh, I tried to go back to school because, because I was an activist over there. They beat me, I left campus, and then started working, journalism, more to punish those who. But when I get to Washington, I went to school, and my three first essays were not good because I was too much into thesis antithesis and synthesis. We have problem and misinformation here because we're living in our silos. When I came to, uh, to Vermont, I thought I was coming to a place where there would be discussion even, bah, 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 but at the end, we agree on something that, you know, grasps every, everybody's, you know, opinion. 
I've been here since 2012. I hardly saw uh, like a debate. People are in their silos. It's about time Vermont walks the talk or talks the walk. Merci. Okay, a lot of uh, very interesting um, things out there right now. So some, some questions. What, what I would like ultimately to, to do, and I hope you guys are game for this, is actually have um, just three breakout groups in about you know, 10 or 15 minutes. One kind of on leadership complacency, what do we do about that? One on how storytelling can help shift us into different thinking. And I think, Eric, I think a lot of people are interested in what's really going on in Africa <laughs> in, in, in many parts of it. And you, you have so much expertise there. And we would just do that for um, about 20 minutes. But before we even get there, what are questions that came up for, for all of you for um, these speakers? Yes, and, and can you help There's oh, yeah. this? Thank you. Our mic woman, thank you. And this isn't for any particular speaker, and this might not even be a question that, that people can answer. And I think, Eric, you spoke to this a little bit. But as someone who's been trained in the sciences and who has also studied the history and the philosophy of science, you know, when you look at various time frames from, you know, the emergence of a pandemic you know, until like three years after the start of the pandemic, our understanding of what is facts changes, and then our understanding of what is misinformation and then disinformation relative to those facts changes. And the same thing is true over the course of decades. You know, thinking of, for example, the emergence of the theory of plate tectonics and how it was utterly dismissed, and the original founders of that were completely harangued and almost pushed out of academia. And now, decades later, we regard it as truth. And so my question is, you know, thinking about misinformation and disinformation, how do we decide and who gets to decide what the truth is in any given moment? Thank you. Response? Yeah. Thank you, Fran. That's a really good question. And ironically, just this morning, I interviewed a guy that I've wanted to interview for a very long time, a guy named Brian Mallow who bills himself as the science comedian. He, he works with the Nobel Academy and a variety of others. His best friend is Brian May. I mean, I just, I, I just wanted to talk to him because of that. Queen, if you don't know Brian May. He's also a, a physicist who works for NASA, I'm an amazing guy. We had a long conversation about this because during the COVID years and the post-COVID years, one of the realizations that came out was that science is always right which of course is ridiculous. That's not the point of science. Science has only ever claimed one thing, and that is that it will be a little bit more right tomorrow than it is today. And for all the people that refute science, Brian actually made this point brilliantly this morning. He said, you know, I find it really interesting that every time something happens where we learn something that refutes something we knew yesterday, and all of the trolls jump on it and say, see, science was wrong. What they forget is that the people who showed them that was another scientist. Because the whole point of science is to create a model that says, my job is to get better every single day. And it's not because you were stupid and therefore wrong. It's because I think I can be a little bit more right. I can move all of us a little bit more forward. I'd like to see a program in place somewhere along the way that makes that point, that helps people say there is no, there is no set, we've, we're done, we've learned it, we know, but rather we have an agreement that we will always constantly move forward by challenging each other, by talking, by communicating. The whole concept of common ground. Common ground doesn't exist. It's not just out there waiting for people to say, there it is, let's go, and then we can talk. It has to be created. It has to be fought for. It has to be developed. And I think that often gets missed in the process. So I apologize, a kind of a long-winded answer to your question, but that kind of codification, I believe, is kind of missing today, and I'd love to see more of that. I'll just say that your question reminds me a little bit, one of the things I was thinking of while Eric was speaking, um, 
is how much more I feel like I understand what's happening in the U.S. when I'm in another country because the news coverage is so much better um, and what that means because part of the reason the news coverage in the U.S. is so bad is that our no offense, Fran, of course there's amazing news coverage as well. Um, but one of the reasons that I think you know we're, we're suffering so much as a community is because as you get a fragmented media market, people want to be entertained. You know, if you want my time, entertain me. And the challenge with that is that then the news stories become shorter and shorter and shorter because they're tr trying to attract as many people as possible. So let's jump to the next thing that you might be interested in. There's those like cliffhangers of what's coming next. Okay, I'll stick around for that story. And so we're not getting as much of the story. So I think your question in terms of what is truth, right? Like there's so many different aspects to that question and some of it is is just also not only like what is being said, what is not being said, who's the, what perspective is the story being told from, um, and what is the depth of information that's provided to us. Uh, I will just uh, add that one day I was on the plane and watching uh, Fox News. The lady next door, like, she finally asked me, how can you, you were black? <laughs> you watch, you watch. I said, ma'am, uh, I learn every morning to go from Fox News to uh, MSNBC, going through all kinds of, you know, uh, variation around the news because it's important. So to me, the truth, fighting, fighting f to be the one who's tr who has the truth is not the real thing. It's to create a, con I mean, an environment where all kinds of idea can come, I'm pretty sure when peop everybody has the right to say something, when we don't judge the guy who, or the lady in front of us because he's a, he's a Republican, he's a Democrat, or he's what, what, I think we could ultimately reach a consensus which may be not the truth, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a starting point to go to the truth. Unfortunately, we don't have it here anymore. We, we went to the US embassies in, uh, in Africa to learn about journalism. We remember great journalists, people that were opinionated, looking for the truth. But nowadays, what you have? You have, if you are, I don't know now the terminology, liberal or whatever, you have your, your channel that you follow, and then at the end of the day, Anybody can give you any kind of uh, insanity or anity? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you guys actually hold on to okay. that? And um, so, <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. And I think the audience mics right right here for Megan. We're ready. Okay, you guys are ready. And we'll make sure to introduce the three of you that came in a little bit later, just right after this. So go, Megan. Well, I just maybe you have some to, comments. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to raise the the obvious thing that I haven't really heard mentioned, which is social media. Has anyone said that word yet? I I, I don't think so. I, actually, I'm really surprised because if you're talking about disinformation, you know, I also worked in the media originally, and um, at that time, you know, it's the classic. There were fewer sources of information, and we would pay attention to them. Or if you're looking to the founding of America, there was no such thing, and everyone would come into a room and do the kind of arguing that you're talking about in order to they came to common ground. Where, where are we now? It's like thousands of sources, hundreds of thousands of sources of information where every single person can state an opinion. And, and it strikes me that that's the problem. I, I mean, I've been convinced of that a really long time ago myself. Uh, it's, we're not going to get towards a more unified society as long as we have all these channels. And I mean, certainly Congress is looking at it. I mean, regulation is certainly, you know, somewhat on the way. I mean, because, you know, children are being watching child pornography without regulation. All of these things that were just hit Congress. And I, Mark Zuckerberg personally stood in front of the Congress and apologized for the terrible information that's being, you know, going through these channels. 
So I can only say maybe it's too easy, but that we need to regulate social media. Yeah. Thank you. And I, and I think the, the video that Eric showed us had those influencers. You know, they're really, really powerful. Um, Steve, you probably have something to say about social media, well, and any of you. And but. I'll even keep it brief. Okay. <laughs> Whatever is just a little bit worse than spawn of the devil <laughs> is, to my way of thinking, social media. As a recovering technologist, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is those algorithms that do what they do so incredibly well. And to their credit, they do them incredibly well. But let's take it one level up and forget about all the science and talk about what they really do. Social media algorithms are designed to move us from a place of community to a place of frankly, tribal behavior. And, and I don't mean that in, in sort of an, an anthropological point of view. I mean that in terms of let's place everybody into silos of one and then pit them against each other so they feel a little bit bad about who they are. And then they start fighting. And then that destroys the common good. Look, the power of story, I mean, you know this better than most, is that story is the fabric that ties us together. If you don't have a shared story, you don't have a community. And communities are inclusive and strong and necessary. And I'm not trying to say that there's this international social media cabal trying to do this. What I'm saying is there is an international social media cabal trying to make a great deal of money by doing this. And let's face it, Okay, th that is the ultimate, that's the ultimate point of success. So until regulation happens, we're going to be in trouble. I do a lot of work in regulation, a lot of work in regulation. And one of the things that people don't realize is regulation doesn't mean control. It means protection. It means protect the people that we are regulating, for, for whom we are regulating a service that they use. And that's not happening. And that, to me, is a singularly dangerous thing, a singularly dangerous thing. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Yeah. I think also uh, about social media. For example, in Africa, people wouldn't have access to information if there was no social media. So c'est un couteau à double tranchant. Uh, that being said, there's also the problem of greed that is behind social media. So much so that even one of the, I mean, one of the, uh, next uh, adversaries when it comes to the uh, i mean to the presidential election he has his own platform and then that platform can even give him money to pay off you know all the, the you know the problem that he has in so social media has a problem and then this is also a problem i'm sorry i love america but this is also a problem for america it's greed whatever we do today is camp lejeune that can give you money but we know that Camp Lejeune has that. So what we do usually is like we let it go because there's so much money at stake. We don't want to hold it. And then later we'll see with insurance, we'll whatever, you know, we'll try to deal with those who have been too much damaged by that. So as a society, we have to think about, you know, what is democracy anymore? And social media is going that way because we witnessing the collapse of democracy. And people think that democracy is only about elections. There will be elections in Africa this year. But some of those folks over there are running for a fourth illegal term that is being backed by the US and by France. Do you think that the people in Africa will wait for uh, CNN or will wait for uh, uh, like, uh, like uh, mainstream media to get what they need? So we need to go back to the core you know, it's like democracy, reverence, respect for each other. You cannot be part of a debate when there's a difference between classes, races, and, and things like that. It will always be. Today is like social media, but yesterday it was cinema. I, I grew up hating the Native American because I liked so much the cavalry. And then I come to the US and I realize that these folks have, been, has, have gone through a lot. When I went to Washington for the first time, I saw a bunch of black guys coming to me. I ran away. My girlfriend said, Harry, calm down. I said, because on TV, that's what I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, 
I, I agree with so much that has been said here. I think that it's so complicated, right? Because on the one hand, you can say we need to regulate. And you look at the mental health crisis that we're facing, and you look at the way our brains react to social media, which is a drug hit, right? Um, and you, you see that like we are programmed in certain ways, and the ways in which social media impacts with how we think and how we feel um, is detrimental to who we are and how we operate both individually and at the community level. However, I hear the word regulation applied to social media or any digital channels, and I also immediately get scared. Because one of the things that we're seeing is that we're seeing this ultimate struggle, right, of who gets to tell their story. The story that I was told is very much the movies that Eric saw, mm -hmm. and it is filled with stereotypes, and it's filled with a specific worldview, right, predominantly the white male view right, people who are in positions of power. The history books that I had in school growing up, I look at those history books now, and I am so afraid of what my daughter is gonna bring home as she goes through school because there's going to be so many trips into the classroom to discuss indigenous people and discuss the creation of our country and discuss the civil rights movement and so many different things. And one of the things that social media does is it gives people of all types and all places a platform to share their story. And there have been many, many events in the US as well as events globally where if there were not platforms for people to share very awful mm -hmm. videos and information, the, the tragedies and the exploitation and the violence and the things that are happening would not have gotten the attention from those of us that need to take action from where we sit in the positions of power we have. Um, so I think it's just incredibly complicated because there's so many different pieces to how we interact with these platforms. One of the things that I, I am often quoted as saying, and I do say it frequently, you know, humans are not ready for the internet. <laughs> and we're not, right? Um, but there's also like for, <laughs> for, for all of our history, we've also been waiting for the internet in terms of an equalizer of how to create a community that's really fed by the experiences of the community. Um, and the community involves all sorts of different lived experiences that we need to take into our story and understand those different pieces of the story. Thank you. Let me just make sure we know who else is in the room, because uh, there are three people, like Shelburne Farms came in, and you, sir. Just your name and your organization. So. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Juan Alves. I work at UVM Extension. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And uh, over there, yeah? Oh, hi, everybody. I'm Jen Cirillo. I work at Shelburne Farms Institute for Sustainable Schools. And apologies for sneaking up on you <laughs> from behind. Um, Megan Camp, also from Shelburne Farms. Glad to be here. And original members, because Shelburne Farms goes well beyond our borders as, as well and teaches a lot of people from all over the world who come here and, and, uh, and vice versa. So welcome. Um, one, is there one where there was a, there was a question and or a comment? Yes. Here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Michelle. Oh, Michelle will fall down. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take off my entrepreneurship professorial hat and put my human hat on who's lived in different countries. And I, one of the issues that was raised, in particular in Eric's video, was what I would call the power and the danger of half-truths. In that we listen to, the, we watch the video. We hear about Russia's putting, you know, broadcasting news to Africa. But the story is being told by Deutsche Welle who's also broadcasting news to Africa. And Voice of America is broadcasting news to Africa. So they're only telling half the story. And I know a lot of people in the US, as well as in Germany, who are put off to the public media because they're only hearing half the story. And so because they only hear half the story, they turn away from the public media. They say, I'm not going to watch ARD or ZDF in Germany. I'm not going to watch NPR in America because it's not telling the whole story. 
So even though these public media stations are on the right side of history or trying to be, they're shooting themselves in the foot by only telling half the story. And I'm curious, how can we move the public media, which is supposed to be fair and balanced, to actually telling a fair and balanced story and to win back the people who we want to hear the whole truth? So that we can have those debates you were talking about and telling more colorful, full-fledged stories. <laughs> wow, that's a... Go for it. That's, that's a big one. Yeah. You know, one. Schön, Eric. Uh, uh, to me, it all goes to teaching people how to search for news. As you know, uh, I remember in uh, I was doing uh, 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 I was t I mean uh, record I mean working on a story in Kenya. And the director, it's about like how remote sensing can help the local folks deal with national parks. So I almost had a dangerous encounter with a lion, but, but it was a very good documentary. And then I was talking to the director of ICPAC, which is the institute over there, which w deals with climate. And he said, Eric, when we were young, uh, there's a story that says, if you kill um, a chameleon, your mom won't wake up or something will happen to your mom. It wasn't true, but that's how they kept <laughs> the kids in control, not killing, you know, because we, we need uh, those uh, animals, to, you know, because the chain of them. But it starts very young, I think, to give uh, uh, to kids the, uh, the, uh, the arms to navigate in a system that is, is based on big interest even even the news even journalism you can be the most you know accurate in your story you will lack something that next door you will have even if it's your opponent so to me it's it starts with education regulation i'm <laughs> i'm not sure because it's freedom of uh, but there need to be a college of uh, people that will be uh, 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 will be responsible once in a while to look at an issue of you know this uh, this newspaper didn't do it right or something but it comes to at the end to f uh, fostering uh, 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 an environment of debate that will ultimately uh, spill into you know uh, uh, journalism because you have the journalism of the society that you live in. If you go to China, it's one story with the Communist Party, because this is who they are. If we embrace democracy, then we need to open up so that we can have that discussion that will save, you know, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, what information goes to uh, the public, you know. I also like the fact that Let's watch Fox TV and listen to NPR or, you know, MSNBC or, or whatever. You need to, f the truth is somewhere in there, we, we hope. But truth is a, a difficult word these days. Colin, did you have something? Oh, here. Yes, in front, up. Sorry, and we'll get right back to you in a minute. I was just going to ask, because um, I work with like four or five and some three-year-olds, even some little babies, um, just thinking about how to really foster um, critical thinking in little kids, because it can be really difficult to, um, I was thinking like today there was a bug inside and we had to take the bug outside and some people wanted to squish the bug <laughs> and I wanted to take the bug outside and that was a whole conversation and so that we were going back and forth about that and um, just thinking about ways to like bring up, I took that as an opportunity to be like, what do we do when like there's somebody smaller than us inside? Like we have to help our, our little friends and like, um, it can be really difficult to have kind of conversations that that kind of connect in that way. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about about critical thinking with little guys, bugs or people. <laughs> Fall back on the adverbs. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that there are, I think, five adverbs, if I remember correctly, who, what, why, when, where, and how. Only two of those are strategic adverbs, leadership adverbs. The others are tactical. 
how and why are strategic. What is that? It's a bug. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to squash it or I'm going to pick it up and take it outside. No one ever asked them why. No one ever said, why, but why are you going to do that? Because that's the kind of question that doesn't get asked often enough. Okay. And the second thing that I would say, and actually this speaks to both of these questions, is reading. Because reading is more than just, can I decipher the words on the pray, on the praise, let's try page. On the page, it's also about, well, what do I think about that? What am I learning from that? And then, again, going back to the why question, which just doesn't get asked anywhere, anywhere often enough, I don't believe. And, and it goes in, it, this is a real storytelling issue. Well, why did that happen? Why did they do that? Why do you think the result is what it was, and so on. So, I'm not sure if that's helpful, but. No, that makes sense. And I'm sure the women behind you at Sheldon Farms would have a lot to say about that as well. Uh, we have one more question um, here. Thank you. Um, well, I have more of a comment, less of a question, but just when we were talking back about like social media and like decrease in democracy and community, I think it's really important to think about the decrease in local news and how that's um, contributing to polarization and how like we as people can help support local news and how that contributes so much to us seeing like our neighbors and people in our local community as people in our community rather than just going on social media and thinking of like an influencer as part of your community. Thank you so much. I think it's critical and it's a, it's a crisis uh, right now in the United States and uh, UVM is doing something pretty cool around that um, with their uh, community media network. I'm not sure what it's called. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you guys, because there have been these um, stampedes outside, I'm just going to have this be a fairly brief, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to choose your groups. And I want you to think about these questions. So, so we really get everybody's voice a little bit in here. So first, I'll give you, I'll give you the questions that I want to think about. Uh, one of the things that was really important to um, my co-founder was action. What are we going to do? What are we going to, we got to come up with something. And I am trying to follow that and make sure that we think about not just listen and uh, oh, the world, oh my God, it's, it's, um, things are not good, which they are, but there are solutions out there. So I want, I want us to think about what are some best practices either in your classrooms or that you've heard about? Uh, what are some solutions that work? What are, um, you know, what, what more can be done? We heard re regulation is one of them, but we have to be careful about regulation and, and what that means. Um, how can we support democracy? How and why is that, is that important? I mean, these are huge questions, but still, how can we teach our kids? How can we really think about helping them understand even, you know, this whole media literacy um, issue and to distinguish and to look for that third source? Uh, how, how do we do uh, some of those things? Um, what what kinds of uh, innovations can we come up with? So I'm going to challenge you with that. I don't work with a lot of farmers, but I work with a lot of communities and rural communities in developing countries. There's a fear of change in different languages. Are you losing your livelihood? I used to do a lot of work as a consultant, and I heard that same thing, and it's not untrue. No, it, it, it's, it's a very valid. Some of the ways to deal with climate change is to put a carbon tax on the price of carbon. Um, so let's, let's hear back some highlights of what happened in your group. Who wants to start? You guys? You, sorry. You guys. You caught, you caught my eye. <laughs> I'll start the summary and then I think Missy can do some. Well, I think we started out Why with don't a. you sit here so Charlie can see you? Is that all right? I'm sorry? From CCTV. Do you mind sitting oh. here talking to the group from here? Okay. Sure. So he can see you. Because he stayed for this. He's, he decided, no, I'm going to find out about the exciting conclusion. <laughs> okay, I'll try to summarize, but. 
uh, we started out trying to just narrow down the topic, and we decided to talk about each of our professional challenges with communication in our respective efforts, and and then we narrowed it down to maybe talking about climate change and and how that was affecting uh, Juan's work in particular with uh, Juan over there from Vermont Extension, right? And he was uh, saying that the farmers themselves often don't respond well to the word climate change. Um, Not all of them. Right. And so then the discussion of how to create a conversation around something that's that hard to discuss because even if you, you know, and should we talk about it in a negative or a positive way? And then you can talk about that. You were saying how everything that you've observed on the negative and positive side is so important. And then we can get to the sort of empathy and livelihood part. Okay? I think. <laughs> so. They loved you, Megan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just okay. Go ahead, sorry. I'll keep it brief. I I think the conversation sort of meandered toward, you know, what is the problem statement, and and the, the, you know it was exemplified by Juan's uh, issue of of some you know the the the. An example of a word like climate change being polarizing, and for you know it, us kind of wondering why is it polarizing to this particular group of people, farmers, and and I spe had speculated that you know I, I don't work directly with a lot of farmers, but that I, I work with with folks who are um, you know in, in agriculture and who rely on agriculture for their livelihoods and. A lot of times, the word climate change sort of signifies a threat to their livelihood, and 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 the possibility of losing their job, which is, you know, something that we don't always think about. We we I think we 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 started to discuss the, this fact that, you know, oftentimes we we sort of consider something like a topic like climate change to just signify virtue. Like, if we're working on climate change, we must be doing good. We must be benefiting society and the environment and you know solutions to climate change don't often don't often don't always benefit certain members of society and so we we just kind of needed to and that's where we transitioned into this idea of empathy and understanding how we can so that's missy so that that's how we can one example of how we can kind of address these polarizing issues is to promote empathy can I add a little thing? Yes, Please. Yes. Thank you. Excuse me. Um, so uh, this idea of you know polarization between you know climate change and not climate change, um, in my experience in the last decade, by you know virtue of you know telling the right story and finding the right words, I think um, the word soil health came to bind the two tribes that were the one that likes climate change, the, the, the one that is not averse to the word climate change and the one that is, uh, and because you know that's a common thing between the two groups. So um, that's the, I think that's the skill we need, you know, to, t to use the right words to find the right story so that we can, because everybody cares about where their food comes from. And so we talk about climate change, you know, there's polarization, but you talk about soil health. It's almost about, almost the same thing, almost the same thing, but, you know, everybody cares about that. It's interesting, like, global warming. Yeah. You go to <coughs> Sorry. I was saying we started at global warming, and then we were like, no, that's too negative. We go to climate change, and then we have to go even further. Exactly. But it's true. Words, words matter. Words really matter. Choosing choosing the right words, especially in these days and times. It, thank you, Juan. Any anybody else from that group uh, want to add anything? Okay. How about uh, this group back here? Who's your spokesperson? Are you gonna? Is that Cecilia? All right. You guys were very engaged back there. Well, everybody was. <laughs> um, 
So we touched a lot on the negative sides of social media, um, but also how we can kind of create a better shared space in our communities. So a lot of what we were talking about before, um, whether that be through storytelling, which the speakers touched on, but also just having more casual conversations on a day-to-day -day basis to kind of create those bonds that can help strengthen our community. Um, and yeah. I'm a bad that summarizer, but <laughs> yeah, if anyone else Any, has anything anybody to add. Wanna, wanna add? Barb, do you want to add your leave your own oh. kids? Oh my gosh. Your kids would better. Okay, so in, I was picking I was picking up on um, Stephen's uh, conversation about leadership and how we address it as well as acknowledging all of the multifaceted, complicated layers that there is to this discussion at all. And I found in my work in several different countries with children along the way that taking the opportunity to give leadership and to teach leadership and have every child participate in the leadership is very, very important because it gives them, and I have found that it gives them a sense of belonging, a sense of responsibility, a sense of being, if I didn't say it already, important, I could say that five times, because when you're a child, being important and being heard and having the opportunity to have other people respect what you have to say and follow you is extremely important to carry forward. And as we enable all of our children to participate in forums that build those sense of confidences, I believe that we also build a sense of community. And that was, I think, my point. Okay. Great, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Barb. Good. I will try to um, summarize our group, and I encourage any of you to, to add to this. Um, and it's interesting that children came up so much. So uh, the, f the first thing was uh, civic education. We all need civic education. And kind of a disappointment that in, in the United States, it's states that rule what happens in education, that the, you know, we, can't, we, we don't have a, a universal like all children should get civic education. It's not, not happening. But also the incredible importance of having kids from different backgrounds be in educational spaces together. Um, uh, national service was brought up. We really should have national service again to have people in connecting with people that they normally wouldn't. It, it puts people together with um, people that they they might not have um, um, had the chance to meet. Uh, Shelburne Farms has been doing this since COVID. They're putting they're putting um, you know kids together uh, from all over the world, from Nepal and from here and um, probably South America and wherever they are, and mainly middle schoolers. And the thing that was was really wonderful is that middle schoolers all have really the same issues, no matter where they are. They're concerned about the same things, and to learn that somebody in Nepal has similar issues to you is very powerful learning. Um, building community came up. There was kind of angst around power is, you know, such a problem in our world. And the um, people who have too much power and people who um, uh, want more power, etc. Uh, there was also a, a, a powerful conversation, a powerful conversation, a conversation about when we step into another culture, we need to move slowly. And we, we need to create relationships and have diplomacy and really e empathy, empathy, and, and find out what is important to them before we come in with our values. So if there are important values that, that we want to um, add or talk about, let's hear their values first. Let's, let's come, come at it from that point of view. Um, so... Um, Oh, and I love this, non-authoritative parenting, where we're both learning. And that's true country to country, the respect, respecting leadership of other countries, respecting children's leadership, um, respecting uh, that, that parents and children both have things to offer each other, and that, and that goes for certainly country to country. Anything I have missed from our group? 
Awesome. This has been uh, this has been really terrific. What a great group of people. I want to cover just a few more things, and then we can we can just socialize with each other and um, eat, etc. So what I want to talk about is the next time we meet, this uh, group meets. We're trying to do twice a year. Uh, we'll think about timing because I think we missed, there are some academics that would like another time, so please email me or suggest now, are there times that are better? Is it January, when in the fall is, is a good time or place to have this that might be a little bit better? So we'll, um, we'll give that some thought. Um, I also, the, the other main topic that came up last time and keeps coming up for a number of people is international exchanges. Mm -hmm. And I think that we heard a lot about how this is very powerful at Shelburne Farms, and I know that's true for a lot of schools. Um, other things that have come up is climate equity, uh, thriving women and girls. We talked about that um, a little bit um, at the last meeting because of um, when it comes to safety, it's often about women and girls. Um, international exchanges sound good for next time. Other things? Okay. Should we do something else? Okay. I'll go with that. I think, I think there's, that happens in so many different ways now. So um, I hope you think about it from business to business, school to school, um, online, many people. people to people. So talking about, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, uh, Cuban American Friendship Society, it's a nonprofit you know, that I'm, I belong to, and the Vermont Institute of uh, uh, Civic Engagement and International Engagement, we send, I mean, we send People by trades, mostly teachers, lawyers, whoever needs like uh, a credit for uh, uh, abroad, you know, from a, a trip abroad, we go to Cuba, and uh, and then I hope I will be able to to propose that to you guys, so we can go to Cuba, and then then you can know, you you can see that you know the embargo. The blockade is not even an embargo. Has a reason, has, you know. Uh, it's a reason why Cuba cannot, you know. Cuba is like trapped in this, you know, uh, a prison because the U.S. doesn't want to talk to them. But not only the U.S., the rest of the world doesn't have the right to do business with Cuba or face sanctions from the U.S. So, right. Uh, but Cuba has a lot to show us like education, 99.9% .9 of people know how to read and write in Cuba. Uh, the teachers that I took there will come back and say, oh my God, Eric, how can they be structured? How can the kids be <laughs> still in class? <laughs> so we have the chance to discuss with the teachers over there. So uh, let's go to Cuba. Yeah, let's go to Cuba. OK. And there's <laughs> So the, the other piece I just, uh, business uh, is that the Vermont Global Exchange, um, if you are interested in, in helping create what happens next time, that's really what this is about. It's totally volunteer run. Thank goodness UVM gives us a room and some food. Um, everything else is very volunteer, so if you would like to be um, more involved and just creating what happens in, in the fall. I would love that. We also, we're really opening up. We want more, more businesses. Um, some government people, they, they always say they're interested and then they never show up, but you know, that's okay. They, they might look at this video. Uh, who do you know that might be more involved in this? It's not that we want a mob. I love this size because we were able to do something really pretty special. But people come and go. People are busy. People are, are interested in this topic or they're interested in a, in a different topic. So um, I would just like to engage you for those of you who want to get on our listserv. I'll put this out on the table where the name tags were. So make sure that to get um, sign up on email. And if there are any other suggestions about how this group can become more dynamic, be more useful for you, uh, we really want to hear it, and I can hear it now and or conclusions for tonight. We are actually ending on time. I'm, I'm a broadcast journalist, so I'm really into timing. I, <laughs> it's, 
it's 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 almost a sickness, but. <laughs> uh, thank you. Any any concluding? And I ha I have some people I want to thank very quickly. Obviously, um, well, let's just do that now, and then and then we'll see if anybody has that burning thing. So, Steve, Missy, Eric, thank you so much for stimulating us in this wonderful discussion today. Really terrific, and to the um, Office of Engagement and Tricia and all of your interns. Awesome. And let's get more of those public health and extension. You guys are doing some amazing things internationally. Well, I'm so happy that you're, you're here. Um, and I, th I think we can, you know, there's so much. It's when people from different specialties get together and hear different things. The last time, and not, you know, to keep going back to that, but it was wild. We had a, a scientist, a soldier, a peace activist, and what was the fourth one? And oh my gosh, the, the it was really fascinating what came out from that combination of people and from very different aspects talking about global security. Oh, and a, a kind of a computer, you know, what's happening in, in that aspect. And when it's, it's then when new things start to spark and, and come out and, and help us. So that's what Vermont Global Exchange is all about. I hope you, you know, talk to other people about it and we want to strengthen it and make sure the people who want to be in this room are in this room. Any concluding statements, thoughts, sparks before, look, we're really like, we have five minutes and we don't have to use them all. <laughs> but any, anything bubbling up for any of you? Should we keep doing this? Yes. All right, good. Thank you guys very much. Please uh, enjoy. Please finish up the rest of the food and uh, get to know somebody you haven't talked to tonight. Thanks a lot.